It was the summer of 2005. I was young, lazy, uninspired, and reluctant to fly to Hanoi to take up a job at the famous Metropole Hotel for five months. I was to endure rigorous food and beverage training to eventually get better at my craft and thought that Vietnam would be an interesting location to have on my CV once I was done with college. I really didn't know what to expect. I got off the plane, immediately greeted by harsh humidity, an overextended sun, and as repeated many times, scooters as far as the eyes could see, with three passengers each and a baby doing pirouettes at the back, all dangerously dancing around each other like a well-rehearsed play that you know is just not going to end well. The buildings were built extremely narrow as insisted by my home for the next few months, a seven-story walk-up with no elevator. The people on the street didn't look particularly friendly either, some of them in what seemed like pajamas, others wearing face masks, all shoving each other for a place around small, low plastic tables right on the sidewalk. What was I getting myself into? I sat down, tired, on a small stool and asked the lady making the food to just bring me whatever she was serving. The bowl arrived, full of steam and flavor. Hints of mint, coriander, fish sauce, and limes hit my nostrils, and suddenly, it happened. This cloud of self-inflicted negativity was lifted. I could see clearly. In front of me, a juicy peach of a city, filled with one of the best food cultures in the world. An intriguing history, a deeply thoughtful people, and a blend of modern and traditional cohesive values was wide open. Hanoi welcomed me, and I knew I was home. If you recall, last year we already went to Saigon for overnight, so you might be wondering why we decided to feature yet another Vietnamese city. Well, for one, Hanoi is the capital city. More importantly, they could not be more different. Everything from the food to how loudly people speak to the weather, it's almost bipolar. But if I had to characterize it in just one image, Hanoi is the more established, adult, comfortable, and cultured father figure, whereas Saigon is the young millennial busy creating a career and growing quickly in many different tangents. Both are great, but my heart sides with the northerner. Once you land and take a quick 20-minute taxi ride into the thick of it, the city can be simplified into six neighborhoods of interest. Quan Kem is the area immediately around the lake, which acts as the center of activity. The old quarter is where you'll find most of the tourists and life as it is on the streets. The French Quarter is an area that is quite quaint but transports you back to early colonial 1900s as soon as you step foot in it. Westlake is a newer, more polished neighborhood where the affluent and most of the expat community resides. Ba Din is what I call the Big Monument District, with most of the massive landmarks and government buildings concentrated there. Finally, Hai Bai Chung is the most local and more chill than the other locations. If you are coming to the city for just a couple of days, I would recommend staying right in between the Old Quarter and Westlake for some peace and quiet that's never really far from the action, somewhere around the Hangma or Quan Chan areas. There are so many reasons for travelers to come to Hanoi, but the food and the vibe the city offers are the ones that keep me coming back. To start off our trip properly, we head off to grab some of that thick, luscious egg coffee that everyone's talking about. So jump out from the busy streets and we're here at Cafe Chung, basically where they make egg coffee. Right next door is Cafe Chan, which is one of the most famous ones as well. And it's just really dark, roasted, beautiful Vietnamese coffee with this like luscious kind of merengue kind of egg sugar thing concoction happening. I don't know exactly what's in it, but it's basically making me so hyper. It's just sugar and caffeine and it's absolutely delicious. When you have this after a long day of walking, it's absolutely perfect. Now that we were awake, we grabbed a quick rice cake snack, soy seo, to complete the energy needed to visit the important sites. 
Huan Kiam is truly the heart of it all. Just stroll around it at any time of the day and you'll find something to do. It will take you to any of the neighborhoods and is a great meeting spot if you ever get lost. So I'm a happy camper. Um, I'm by Huan Kiam Lake and I have my soy say tit. I think that's correct if I'm not butchering that. And it's basically rice, some corn, some pork. It's all stewed down. It's one of those street foods you won't find elsewhere, but you find it here and it's really good. Some dried onions, some garlic in there. Tasty. And here, it's actually really famous because there used to be a turtle that lived here, but it died a couple of years ago and it was just like this, this, this big, huge thing because it was one of those giant old turtles. Um, but it's, it's really a hot spot for tourists and just people just congregate naturally towards here. And I've never seen so many selfie sticks in my life. I thought us people from Manila had problems with selfies, but apparently people love it even more here. Come early in the morning for some traditional group exercises or the hilarious laughing yoga that is sure to put a smile on your face. Or come at night to start things off with some bar and cafe hopping on the old quarter side. Once we completed our almost two kilometers round of the lake, we dove into the French Quarter to visit my former place of work. It's actually really funny being here. I used to work here in 2005, so about 10 years ago. And not much has changed, and I'm really kind of happy to see that, that it's pretty much, it looks the same, the uniforms are the same, the menus are pretty much the same. And this place has been open since 1901, so it has a lot of history. We're in the middle of the French Quarter, so we're, we're going to see the opera later and all these things. And the architecture is just so astounding and so beautiful. It really just brings you back to an era that you kind of feel nostalgic about. Um, more and more, we're just here drinking a, a coffee in, in what we call La Terrasse, which is actually something I was really involved in. Uh, when, when I worked here, this wasn't open yet. Um, this was one of my first projects and actually opening something and designing something from the ground up. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, and this is why I love Hanoi. You keep coming back to these places that just stay the same and people are still so nice and the quality is still so great. It's really just a different place altogether. Our first proper meal just had to be pho. But this was complicated because pho in Hanoi, unlike Saigon, is a religion. It makes sense, the north gets colder and a majority of the dishes in the north are served with rice noodles. There are so many places to choose from. So to make it easier during our short trip, we tried multiple places to give you a taste of it all. This is pho ten li kok su, I probably butchered that. We have three cuts of meat in three different bowls. And my biggest frustration last time, I was freaking looking for these these beautiful deep fried donuts and we didn't find them and I'm so happy that the first place we hit in Hanoi has them. This will bring me back to when I used to live here all the time. This is what usually you do, you just kind of just dip this, absorbs all that, you know, all that flavor. And I think this is something they probably borrowed from the French. Um, you know how French people usually use a baguette to kind of dip in sauces and stuff, so this is probably like a Vietnamese, um, you know, Vietnamese style of doing that as well. We are in the French Quarter, so... <laughs> That's good. So we're at Phu Bat Dan, and so this one seems to be a bit murkier, a bit darker than the ones previously. Uh, more vegetables as well, but still not, still not served with like that big mound of herbs. A little bit of lettuce, a little bit of mint here. Flavor-wise, for um, a beef food, compared to the last one that we had, that one is a bit more clear, a bit cleaner. This one has kind of a, a really nice sodium kick to it. Some black pepper that's in there as well, and you feel like all the vegetables that are that are inside also. And the beef seems much better than, than the last space. If I had to compare both beef foods, I would definitely say this one tastes cake over the previous one. Our clear winner, chicken dinner. I'm so excited for this, I love chicken foot. I don't even know how you get that much flavor from chicken. It's crazy good. Chicken noodle soup, ain't got shit on this. It's bright, clean, you can add some chili if you need that heat. That just like opens it up completely. That is wild. Chicken, if I were making this at home, my chicken would be totally dry. Nice and chewy. Has that nice consistency and obviously in Hanoi you always have these just beautiful noodles. That's gorgeous. If you are only here for a short stay, I would usually recommend just exploring the streets and the everyday life of Hanoians. 
I find some of the local quirks absolutely fascinating. Some of the key sites that I believe are worth visiting are the Temple of Literature, the Opera House, Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum, the Perfume Pagoda, and the Imperial Citadel. In food, people from every social class become equals in front of the myriad of stalls peppered along every road and avenue. You have never truly experienced Vietnamese cuisine if you haven't had it here. People drive in on their motorbikes, men dressed smartly in silk shirts, ladies covered head to toe in some sort of protective garment to shield them from the dirt and the sun no less, and not from potential accidents. They park their bikes in a secretly understood system with the stall and shop owners, pick or line up for a table and order from an extremely concise menu. The stalls differentiate themselves with usually white signs with block letters signifying what kind of dish they're serving. These will vary from actual hole-in-the-wall restaurants to right-on-the-street kitchen setups. The amount of choice will make you dizzy. So to help you get straight to the point, here is Selene Yusuf with a much-needed lesson in Vietnamese street food vocab. Just like you guys, I love Vietnamese street food. Although I know some of the words may be difficult to understand. That Viet means anything that is special or a combination of ingredients. Using the sentence, look at that Viet, cheese so fine. Bang pho are the rice noodles used in pho. He got drunk in a club and got banged for life. <laughs> me is egg noodles. Look at me. Rao means vegetables. Rao. Now let's discuss the tips. Tip means meat. Tip bow is beef. Tip be means veal. Tip heo means pork. Tip ga is chicken. Ugh. Man, these Vietnamese sure like a good pair of chips. Nam chua is sausage. Chung is egg. If I were born in Shanghai, my name would be chua, living with my sister Chung. Ah oui, boy is salad. Got to go! Armed with this newfound knowledge, go around, explore, stumble into some unsung gem that no blog, Instagram, or food writer or YouTuber has ever written about. And trust me, there are probably thousands of places that don't get the right amount of publicity. And who knows, they might not want to. Aside from the staples, we met up with university students Lily and Han to eat some dishes that we probably would never have found alone. These are basically worms that are only in season in September. So what they do is they freeze it so that they have enough worms for the whole year. And then this is the only stall in Hanoi that actually still sells it. So it looks like a fish cake. Yeah, but actually in here they have worms and meat and eggs and you know the and the orange zest. Orange zest. Yeah. Okay. And pepper and chili and a lot of things. <laughs> And how do you eat it usually? Just this with the leaves and then you dip it, right? So you dip, you take it in, All right. you dip it in the and the third you just eat outside. After. Let's try this. Okay, this is my, my first worm experience in the night. That's good. It tastes like, it tastes like a shrimp cake. She showed me the picture of what it looked like raw. I don't think you'd be able to eat it, but it, 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 it's actually pretty tasty. So how do we eat this? Uh, here. Put it down. So this I have those smaller ones. Okay. You stick it in here, find the snail, put it down, cut the rice a bit. Here, lemongrass, here, ginger. So this is very traditional here, people eat this a lot? Yeah. yeah. You can look at this. It's very, very full. Especially in winter, because this one really hot. Okay. So we eat a lot in the winter. And then this is, what do you uh, call this? Cake? Mangzhao. It's a cake with pork and... Pork and rice, right? Yes. Okay. Come on. Okay. <laughs> we just got scolded. She doesn't like us because we're taking too much space. She's just really nervous about the thing that we take the place on the, the other store. <laughs> yeah. Time for a little food coma before experiencing Hanoi by night.
Nightlife is quite strange in the city. There's a strictly enforced curfew where bars need to start closing around midnight or 1am. Nothing has really changed from when I was here in 06. I remember that if we found ourselves in a bar past curfew, the owners would simply turn off the music, close their screens so that from the outside it looked like the place was dutifully closed. However, the image from the inside was a bunch of slightly inebriated people trying not to make a peep, thinking hiding under tables will obscure them from the view of law enforcement were they to force themselves in. So Hanoi's energy at night is like really something really different. It's Sundays, a lot of people come out on the street, there's lots of bands just randomly kind of popping up. All these street stalls, all serving different kinds of things. We just ate in a place that made basically, just using pho, pho basically means just noodles. So they made a really great rice noodle dish, stir fried with some beef and some really nice vegetables, really tasty. And it just gets really loud and really crazy. There are kids running around, there are bands playing, there are foreigners, there are locals. It's just a really good place to be at night. So what do people do? They drink, quick and early. A simple solution that gets you where you want to be, yet helps in getting up for work in the morning. We ended up going to the famous beer corner for a quick one. So the rules of Yahoi is you find a seat, you stick to it because it gets really crowded. So whenever you see a free space, just go ahead and grab it. People will come to you with different menus or their beer, usually from the shop that's behind you. There's a structure and a system here that I'm not too sure exactly how it goes, but it, is, it does seem quite organized, but yet very chaotic to the untrained eye. Then what happens, people usually come by to offer you food, anything from shrimp cakes to shrimp crackers to snails. It's just really kind of like a massive, nauseous feeling you get on your senses because there's so much happening, but it's just so great because you get to absorb all of it. If lots of noise and draft beers aren't really your thing, there are many other options. Kama ATK for a proper underground eclectic feel to the city, the Hanoi Social Club for an always fun experience, Barbetta, Tadioto, or going around the Suanjiu area and seeing what the expats are up to. You also have the option of going to smaller backpacker focused clubs in the center of town or their larger than life big party clubs a little outside of the city center but I would not recommend those. After our beer, we ended up checking a bunch of smaller places and we slowly started noticing that there were a lot of balloons floating around. The people seemed happy enough at night, but what was the point of the balloons? So I asked our friends if I could try one, thinking that I could do a really funny intro with a high-pitched voice. But I got more than I bargained for. How am I supposed to sound? I still sound like Bane. <laughs> I am Batman. <laughs> I don't know, dude. It just it keeps getting lower and lower. I feel like I'm in slow mo. Now, I wouldn't recommend anyone trying this. These chemicals can be definitely harmful in the long run. And after a while, I started feeling a little disoriented. Laughing gas, unfortunately, is no laughing matter. And I'm still quite surprised that it's something that is sold so freely to the youth. Well, nothing is though can't fix. This is fish noodle. We wake up early the next morning to meet Chef Hao of the Hanoi Cooking Center and see if he can take us to some more local eats that we may not have found by ourselves. But before that, I had an itch for those lovely thin rice pancakes filled with various meat and mushrooms they call ban kuen, and Chef knew just the place. So uh, the uh, ban kuen, this uh, is the uh, pork, yeah. and the egg, with the egg, this one you get the chicken inside, this one you get the prawn. Okay, and then this is? Ah, this is the Spencer one. So this is a black bug. For English, you can put the water bug. Water bug. Yeah, okay. and you can take the smell. Can you smell this? Oh wow. Yes, very is... That's from here. Yes, the That's oil. Crazy. From... It smells like Yes, very strong. It smells like rose. Yeah. Wow. Someone they can taste this and they put in there to take out the oil. We take the chopstick, dip inside and one rope in here and whisk just for the flavor. Very strong. Just one rope enough. It tastes like um like flowers. Yeah. Like rose. This is, this is the real deal. Yeah. So good. So this is the egg. 
Yes, yeah, the egg. This is the one I'm the most excited. Yeah. That's delicious. Next stop, a soup place in a hidden food alley filled with tasty treasures to get our hands on a snail and banana blossom broth. This one is the uh, bún ốc. Bún ốc, okay. Bún ốc, uh, chuối đậu. Chuối đậu, this means the banana and the, uh, and the tofu. We have the snail and we get the tofu yeah. and the banana, green banana with our skin. Is this something that's typical from Hanoi or...? Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. all, all of this? Is this all of this, very yeah. Very northern food? Yes. The, the banana, banana, banana. Mon, yeah, yeah. What's the, the biggest, biggest difference between the North Hanoi food and then the South? In the, here we get the winter time, it's cold, so the North is eat more salty, more salty, salty. Yeah. yeah. So in the Saigon, they eat more sweet. You can really taste it. the broth is what, tomato? Yes, the tomato, to make the color. Okay. And a little bit sour. When you taste this one, the good one, you need to taste a little bit sweet, yeah. sour, and enough the salt. It has everything, yeah. Yeah. I know what you're all thinking, but what about the banh mi? Well, you'd be surprised that Hanoi is not actually known for the sandwich that we have all accepted as a staple but you can still find some pretty good ones in the city. Although they are not as composed as the ones you would find in the south, they can get quite inventive. From a very French style baguette with a homemade pate and some pickles, to a kebab banh mi that is gaining popularity on the streets here. We're doing banh mi lang ong. Lan? Lan ong. Uh, so what's special about this one is that it's very simple, right? So it's just pate, cucumbers, a lot of coriander, right? So our cilantro, pork floss, and then some sort of chili sauce. Again, banh mi is probably the most famous sandwich out of Vietnam, and I'm really excited about this. This is banh mi number one in Hanoi. I think. But it's good. So the quest to find the best banh mi continues. You've got these nice kind of clean tables, these wooden tables that are kind of spread out and laid out, which were really cool. Um, and it's just really fun to see it develop that way locally. So you even have the craft paper, the nice sticker, the branding continues. So open that up. So the last one we had was kind of all pate. This one seems to be a bit more full. So we got pate, some pork, pickles, vegetables. Give it a taste. Hopefully this one will live up to our expectations. Briny. The pork has some nice smokiness to it. And yet it has that bite of vinegar when you're looking for it, which is really cool. I like this one. Toasted with butter, where it's supposed to be. So it doesn't get more old school French than this. It's pretty crazy. You walk through here, you've got this window pane with like some old school pâté, charcuterie style stuff. We got some homemade hams in there. Some bachiri, which is basically some white cheese that we have in France that we use a lot. There's a lot of different things. You can have just the charcuterie and just the pickles, but I ordered the banh mi with some pickles, some pâté, and some ham. And the bread is probably the fluffiest and cru most crusty we've got so far. Open that up. So you've got that traditional pâté that we had in that first banh mi with a little bit more pickles and then the, the ham as well. So this looks really good. I'm really, really excited about this one. Tasty. This so actually reminds me more of a French sandwich than anything else. But the hit of pickles and the chili just make the sandwich so Vietnamese and just so delicious. This is definitely in my top list. When I travel, I do a lot of prior research online, through books, and by contacting people who are kind enough to lend me some of their time and help out someone who's just really interested in their city. This time around, I was greeted very kindly by both Van Le and Nguyen Cui Duc. Both gave me great insight as to how far the city has come and where it is today. Hanoi has always been in, in a state of transition, for, in my view. It just keeps changing. And whatever I think in the morning and by the afternoon, I've changed my mind about it as well. It's, it's a very youthful 
uh, city, although it has this long history. I think people do feel the change and feel the, the wealth that's available. And in the urban areas, everybody gets to have a, a motorcycle, an iPhone. Underneath it, it's still a lot of poverty and people struggle. But when you're in Hanoi, you don't tend to see it. One of my favorite things about Hanoi is that how you can have a really cool bar or underground music scene and then right next to it you have a lady selling snails and frogs on the street and you don't see that anywhere else and you have from my perspective you have every different kind of social class eating the same thing on the side of the street whether they're poor or they're rich why do you think it's so culturally ingrained here i think like we we was born with it with all the street vendors and everything like normally if I go out with my friends, I'd rather choose to sit on, on the pavement and yeah. just eat rather than go to a fancy restaurant and yeah. stuff. It's just like a custom here. Yeah. So we try to retain it like a part of us. I think the art scene here comes and busts. For every, every two years something happens, oh, a new centre, a new efforts, a new group of artists. They die out, you know. Like artists anywhere else, they don't have enough money, they can't manage it well. Um, then there's an extra dimension of government interference. But then after that, somebody else will come up and new issues will come up. And there are lots of social issues that people want to talk about. Yeah. Freedom of expression, religious freedom, the fight against tradition, new roles for women, all of that is is on the surface, it's there, and so it makes it uh, an exciting scene. Yeah. One very stark contrast that I felt from when I used to live here until now is that people in general are just more open, friendlier, they'll talk to you easily. Yes, they don't, the, the, the young people don't have the burden where in the past you have your neighbors watching you and your parents are much more careful. Now you're freer to do things, I find less interesting some of the books that are being written um, because things are open because things are, are good in some sense um, and yet you have a younger generation that speaks foreign languages that travel and they are learning things they are seeing things and they're exchanging ideas with others so that's that's what's happening the internet is changing Vietnam completely we are quick to forget that this city was under duress just about 50 years ago a number that may seem dated, but when you think about it from the perspective that a lot of the people that we met on the streets have actually seen the country rise from a tough, torn, civil unrest to the unified and progressive front that it puts forward today. A communist nation coping in an international market trying hard to adapt to its increasingly young population yet stuck with one foot in old values, where basic rights like freedom of speech can still be highly scrutinized and censored. The increasingly younger 93 million are starting to ask for state-owned enterprise reforms and a freer financial market, and I wish them all the best because the country has such strong potential in the region. For our last meal in one of my favorite cities in Southeast Asia, we go for what is said to be the best boon sha in the city. After having this particular dish in this stall, I think I may start changing my tune in my thoughts of what dish should represent Vietnam as a country. Because this is currently where the belt deserves to be for now. Today we're eating Bun Cha. We're really lucky that where we're staying is right next to one of my favorite Bun Cha places in the city. And everyone you ask in Hanoi where to eat Bun Cha, they'll send you over here. It's absolutely fantastic. So for those who remember the Saigon episode, we had Bun Cha there, but everything was prepared in a bowl. The difference here in Hanoi is you get this bowl of beautiful meat with that sauce already there imbibing everything. You got some chilies on the side, bean sprouts obviously, some mint, some lettuce, some fried spring rolls, and then these beautiful, just gorgeous rice noodles. Like the bounce of them are absolutely crazy. And now I'm gonna just gonna top docking because I'm so hungry. So I'm gonna put a little bit of chili into my little bowl here. Grab some of my noodles, put that in there. So this is kind of like make your own adventure. Noodle, meat, a little bit of mint, coriander, your fried spring roll right in there. Delicious doesn't even cut it, man. This is glorious.
So good. A few last hours left in our day, preparing to say goodbye to the city I love. I get a shave on the street to look fresh for a proper farewell. That was actually one of the best shaves of my life. I paid 100,000 dong, I'm not sure I got ripped off or not, but it's totally worth it. We managed to catch a chill acoustic session at the Hanoi Social Club surrounded by like-minded individuals throbbing to new music discoveries. I'm just trying to make it through the day. As I tune out to the strokes of notes, I remember why I'm in love with Hanoi. It gives you the quintessential Southeast Asian experience everyone needs to go through for the first time. Hanoi is the perfect partner to pop your cherry. It has all the beautifully textured chaos you've seen in movies, a remarkable food culture that will get you lost in new flavors, herbs, and combinations that were unheard of. Just the right amount of English where you still need to struggle to get around and actually feel like you are truly traveling and learning. Four seasons in a year to appease those that can't take the intense heat the region can experience. And finally, the struggles of a population that is trying to make its mark in the world. A hunger to showcase their creativity, history, and their prospective future. A glimpse of what is to be. But if you ask me, it's always been there. A gem nestled stubbornly in an obstinate crevice, with just enough space for its optimistic light to shine through. Make sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat for updates and behind-the-scenes pictures and videos. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel.